<laughs> Hello again, welcome back. We're in part four of this video series. We're going to talk about particle systems. Here's the good news. We're not really going to do anything new exactly. I mean, there, of course, there's going to be something new. Otherwise, what would be the point of this particular video? But in this section of videos, what I really want to focus on is just is, is what we're really going to focus on is, hey, we learned how to make this thing move around the screen. Now we want to make lots of things move around the screen. And, and, and you, you, know, you might be saying to yourself, and this is accurate, that we already know how to do this. We have a mover object. We could make an array of movers. We could have an array of 100 movers and loop through those movers and have them all on the screen. And while this is true, um, what, I, what, what this section of videos, what we want to look at, A, I mean, I kind of, I don't know why I'm not just coming out and saying it. I want to look at an array list. So what is perhaps a more effective way of managing collections of many objects? Sometimes we have none, sometimes we have many, sometimes we need to add, subtract, delete. We need to manage systems. What if we have a system of objects? What if we have multiple systems of objects? This is the kind of thing we're going to need in the future. <laughs> I don't mean like when the robots take over. I just mean in the next set of videos later. We need to. We, we're going to look at flocking systems and evolutionary systems and many examples where, you know, crowds and pathfall, all these examples where there are lots of things moving around the screen in groups, subgroups, inflicting forces on each other, talking to each other, interacting with each other. We need, a, we need a, some organizational principles by which to live. We're looking to just, in this section, not create new functionality, but just look at how do we organize our code in order to make examples of of systems of elements. And that's what a particle system is. You know, particle systems, you know, you people use them for certain things. You see, oh, this fire effect and this explosion and smoke and all these kind of computer graphics effects are modeled with particle systems. But this here, right now, in this place that we are <laughs> somewhere in the video making land, we're really not, we're not being so specific about particle systems. For us, a particle system is any time we have a system of many objects. So um, this is what we want to look at. So uh, before we get to that, though, let's, let's go back and sort of think about the history of particle systems. You may or may not be aware. I don't know if this is necessary, but I'm going to try it. Um, you know, particle systems were first, will this play? <laughs> I'm so not rehearsed for this. This is an experiment. Um, particles, the, the term particle system was first coined for the movie The Wrath of Khan. And there's this scene which is playing out right behind me, the Genesis effect. Right here is the first instance of a computer graphics particle system. Right? I believe this planet is being terraformed right now. So what's going on here? There are lots and lots of little dots emanating from this sphere all together with these behaviors. And we're getting this kind of fire effect. That's the first example of a particle system. Um, what's interesting about this kind of stuff is if you go to the Nature of Code website and look at further readings down here, there's some links to papers. You can go back and read the original paper, Particle Systems, a Technique for Modeling a Class of Fuzzy Objects, um, which I think this is from the early 80s. And what's kind of amazing to go back and read these papers is you'll see it's all the same stuff we've been talking about. OK, we need to model the motion of a singular dot, and we're going to use position and velocity and acceleration and apply forces. And then we're going to make lots of those dots and you know, we'll blend them and add colors and all this kind of stuff. But this is really the, the kind of history of what, we've been, what we're looking at doing here. You can find them in these papers. And another great example of that is um, a, a work called Particle Dreams by Carl Sims, which I encourage you to go and watch. Uh, right now, there's just the title here. But um, you can see. Uh, I'm talking over this thing, which is just playing it on. I, I, I guess I wanted to, um, you can see the, the kind of myriad of effects here. Here is a particle system of snow, but you can see these are just dots responding to forces. Um, in a moment, we look at this head. This is a particle system, lots of dots. They have position. Now they're responding to gravity. So these, this, and this is another great, um, you can go take a look at the um, paper uh, for this. For that particular video as well, and again, you're going to see the same thing. OK, how do we model snow? Well, we need an individual object that has position, velocity, acceleration. Um, we're going to apply forces to it. All of this stuff in particle systems is what we've been looking at all along. So for us, what we first need to do to model a particle system is create that class to describe the individual particle. Class particle. This is what we need. And this is where I'm now making the point that we're not doing anything new at all. In fact, we've already written this class 
multiple times over and over again in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Only we called it a mover. And now we're just renaming it to a particle. What does it have? It has location, it has velocity, it has acceleration. It has all of those things. It has a dis update method, it has a display function, all this stuff we've already done. But, but now let's, I need to bring up another point. <laughs> I didn't realize that I was going to bring up this point before I started this video, but I, I think I'm... Okay, let's take a look at this example here, which is example 4.3, the simple particle system. This is where we're kind of looking to get to pretty much by the end of the second or third video in this part four section. So the thing about this is we can look at this and say, okay, clearly there's many particle objects on the screen. You might ask the question, how many? Well, you could sort of guesstimate at any one time there's a certain number. But if you think about this, looking at this, how would you do this with the standard array? It's not a fixed number. What we're doing here is creating this illusion of there being like this hose that's just pouring out particles. And there's an infinite stream of particles. This is what we're going to add to our mover class, which is now our particle class. This ability to kind of fade out and end. Right? So we can have new particles, new particles, new particles, new particles, old particles die, new particles come. So before we move on to the next video, which is really going to start looking at, aha, how do we organize all these particle objects into an array list, let's just add one piece of functionality to our what now is our particle class. So let's look at our particle class, which is over here in this particular example. And we can see there it is, a particle goodbye. Every time I run this, it would be nice to like, right? a particle appears and leaves. Goodbye. So you can see here, we have a particle class, location, velocity, acceleration. We have an update method. Acceleration goes to velocity, velocity goes to location. We draw a display method, we draw the, the particle. This is everything we've done all all the time, always in any previous example that you've seen. In fact, we've taken a step backwards, and we don't even have the apply force function in this particle class. It's simpler than that. Of course, we're going to add that back in later. So one of the things I want to add to this is just this idea of a lifespan. How could we have this particle um, have a moment where it's finished? Either it leaves the screen as one option. That's when we don't need it anymore. But, or we could have it fade away. How could we have something fade away? This is an incredibly simple thing for us to do. All we need to do is add a single variable to this particle class. I can call it lifespan, which has an initial value of, say, 255. And then what would I do? When the particle is updated, velocity gets updated. Location gets updated. Let's also update its lifespan. And we're in this case, we're going to consider the lifespan counting down. So we're born with a value of 255, and every frame that value goes down and down and down. We get older and older and older, eventually gets to zero, and we're done. So every frame, we're going to say, hey, lifespan minus equal, and I'm going to say two. So we don't, we don't live very long. Now, if I run this, what's the difference? Nothing. I mean, that secret variable is in there counting down, but we haven't used it for anything. So we need to use it for two things. The first thing we're going to use it for is we can use, we can tie that value to the object's alpha. OK, so if we can add lifespan to the stroke and lifespan to the fill, right, as the second argument of stroke and the second argument of fill with a grayscale color is alpha. So now if we run it again, we can see it fades away and disappears. This is excellent. The second thing we need to do is determine when is that particle finished. We need the particle itself to be able to know when it's no longer needed. When is it no longer needed? When we can't see it anymore. When can we not see it anymore? When that lifespan value has gone down. When its alpha value is 0, what's the alpha value of that lifespan variable? So we could actually write a method. which says, if lifespan is less than or equal to 0, return true. Otherwise, return false. Look at this. This is pretty interesting here. We have now added a function to this particle called isDead. It's a Boolean method, meaning it returns true or false. When it's done, it returns true. When we still need it, it returns false. When is it done? When the lifespan value has become less than or equal to 0. Now, once we have this method, what we can do in the main draw loop is we can ask, if the particle is done, what should we do? 
What should we do to that particle? <laughs> well, there's lots of things we could do to it. We could change its color. We could print something out. We could, we could I don't know what we should do with it, actually. But let's just do something really kind of ridiculous. I'm going to draw a red background on the screen. This is just to demonstrate that we now are able to determine that the particle is fading away. When it's done, the background is now red. So this is really key, because when we go back to that previous sketch, recent, 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 right? When we go back to this particular example, we are going to need to know when those particles are finished so we can remove them from the system. We don't want this, if we have an infinite stream of particles, we don't want to have an infinitely large list of particles. We want to add particles when, at, at moments when we want to add them and delete them when moments we don't need them anymore. OK, so we're kind of churning along here. We haven't gotten very far. This is kind of a little introductory video to the idea of a particle system. The next video, we're going to dive deep into the details of how to actually use an array list in processing. So to get yourself ready for that video, find yourself an example of some object you've made moving around the screen, a single object. And, um, and I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm like pressing buttons while I'm trying to talk. Find yourself that example of your single object moving around the screen and rename the class to particle and get ready to sort of take the lead. Find something that you want to duplicate many, many times. If, you have been, if you've been really working really hard on the motion of one individual object and you've been waiting, waiting, waiting for the time where you can make lots of them, this is that moment. So find that class, bring it over to wherever you are. And in the next video, we're going to look at adding multiple instances of that object to an ArrayList. Okay. It's kind of a disaster, but I'm going to press the button now. Goodbye.